My mother, Myrna Onisha Juliana, was born in March of 1914. She was born in Toronto, which is curious because we have no relationship with Canada except that our family, going back hundreds of years, as I later came to find when I did my family history, has lived along the uh, American-Canadian border, very close to it for a long, long time. Well, my grandfather, Albert Washington Cooney, who was, they tell me, seven feet tall, uh, left uh, Pearl, my grandmother, and somehow she had gone to the Canadian National Exhibition. She probably had one child at that point called Myra, who's the oldest sister, but was pregnant with Myrna, my mother. And my mother was born in Toronto. Well, people can be born in Toronto, but you'll see later why this becomes an interesting increment to the story. Um, my mother was troubled. She went to what they called a girls' school in Batavia, New York, for burning down the family barn. I think today we'd probably call it some kind of juvenile facility. Uh, she was dark. She liked American Indians, and uh, her mother, Pearl, bought her an American Indian outfit that she used to wear. Uh, there was at one time a picture long lost of her in that. So she had a great and deep respect for Native Americans. Uh, but she was uh, troublesome to me uh, because she was uh, <laughs> precocious as hell and wouldn't let things go and liked to toy with people much as perhaps I have occasionally been accused of. So she was hard work, but of course I loved her, and she was uh, uh, completely devoid of any education, but my sister Joan would tell you, where she here, that she would be sent to the Albion Swan Library once a week to get a great big carrier a bag full of books by Plato, uh, Shakespeare, uh, you know, these kind of really heavy reading, you know, War and Peace. Uh, so she was a self-educated woman and loved words, fantastic vocabulary. But she was difficult on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to deal with reasonably, often and oftentimes not. Um, all of which brings us to me getting a job as Ronald McDonald for McDonald's of Canada in 1982. Um, I had a wife, but I also had a mistress called Jill Lee, who was uh, very wealthy. And uh, interesting, my my wife was aware of that uh, relationship. Um, however, the uh, financial benefits of, uh, yes, I'm a rogue, uh, but an honest one, uh, of that relationship were such that my wife <laughs> overlooked it or was willing to overlook it at a certain level. Her family owned half of the uh, uh, media uh, in the Channel Islands of Great Britain, Jill's family did. So we were staying at her house. Uh, we meaning myself and my mother, because my mother had become good friends with Jill. Jill was a genteel lady from uh, uh, Jersey and uh, from obviously a great family, and she's a lovely lady. She made, made Battenberg cake, you know, you put all the little squares together, it takes like two weeks to make this cake, you know? So she was a gourmet and she was, yeah, I was having an affair with this lady. Um, I was young, I was maybe 30, and I was determined to be successful. And uh, so that might have been a move that I made to be with a rich lady who helped me out a lot, 
whole family actually. So uh, on this one that I, we were going to bed and my mother looked really tired. I thought she looked tired, you know? And I had done something that displeased her, which was sort of a, not an irregular occurrence. And she said, if, at the bottom of the stairs, if you don't, whatever she told me not to do or to do, I'm going to tell your sister Joan. I said, I'm 30 years old. I don't care if you tell Joan anything. Joan being my eldest sister, what do I care about Joan? Get out of here. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. She went to bed. So my mother, just I guess for fun, for something to do, had a babysitting job where she worked for a family uh, taking care of these two kids, and she loved the kids, and that was something fun for her to do. She was at this time about 71. And uh, I heard her around 5 o'clock get up to go to the bathroom. I was in an adjacent bedroom with Jill. And uh, then we woke up again around 9, but she leaves the house about 8. So what? What? Uh, what? So Jill went in to the bedroom of my mother, and she, I heard this. Oh my God, Jeffrey, your mother's dead! Now, uh, <laughs> I became immediately hysterical. I was shaking uncontrollably. Uh, I knew that I had to, or I felt that I should uh, call my brothers and sisters. I called my sister Sharon, uh, who I've always been close to. She's passed away now. And I couldn't dial the phone. I just couldn't dial the phone. It was like, you know, I couldn't, my hands wouldn't, I couldn't control my body, you know. So there's, finally I got through and I said, Mom's dead, you know. And, uh, wow. Um... And they came and they took her away, uh, the, the funeral people. Uh, Jill was uh, in palliative care, so she knew a lot of doctors and they called someone immediately and the guys came over, the undertakers came over, these young guys dressed. And I didn't even look at the body, I just couldn't look at her. But I know that she had fallen on the bed and her hands were like this and her eyes and her mouth was open. I just, was too much for me, I didn't, I'm not into looking at, you know, even to this day. So she, there she was, and they, you know, I was in the living room crying, and the doctor came over, and he was saying, I'm, his name was Mickey, so I'm so sorry, Jeffrey, and then, and, and, and this clonk, clonk, clonk down the stairs, and the, with the big wheels on it that go up and down, and the guys in, dressed in black, and they wheeled her out with the, in the body bag. And I thought, I had composed myself to the point that... Uh, I knew I had to tell the kids. Now this was uh, Devin, my oldest son, and his sister, Seisha, my oldest child at that time. They were like 12, something like that, 11 and 12. So I summoned up, you know, enough gumption to get on the phone, and I said, Seisha answered the phone. And I said, uh, Seisha, I have to tell you something about, um, yeah, Grandma. She said, Grandma's right here. She says, at the, at the rocking chair. We, we had a beautiful home at that point. And there was, uh, in our bedroom there, Brenda and my bedroom, there was a lovely, I lo I like, I've always liked rocking chairs. It was a lovely rocking chair we had for years and years and years. And she said, Grandma's right here. You want to talk to her? She's just, uh, she's just rocking back and forth. And, uh, and um, yeah, I, I, didn't, I, I fell asleep. I didn't know she was going to stay here and babysit. Uh, I didn't know what to say. Uh, my mother was dead in Toronto, but she was at 735 East uh, Market Street in Lockport, New York, uh, sitting at the bed, uh, very much alive, solid, you know, just there. In her rocking chair, uh, looking at the children, rocking back and forth, babysitting. Well, I put the phone down, and I drove as fast as I could, like, really, like, well, way over 100 miles an hour. Uh, the 100 and 
30 or 40 miles back to my house in Lockport. And that's the end of that story. Uh, my mother died and was in, at, and in two places at the same time. I have no explanation. I know that the kids weren't lying. I was calling to tell them that my mother had died. I told them later when I got there, because I, well, I won't tell them on the phone. And I was so, I mean, that's a, that's a morning you don't forget, you know. Um, okay, your mother died, but she's, she's babysitting your kids 130 miles away. Again, I don't do these things to lie to you people. I even told you that I was a bit of a cad uh, in my early years, taking opportunities uh, uh, whence they could be found. So that's the story of my mother being two places at the same time, one of them being stone dead.